All right, Gator. Uh -oh. Hello, is this the sheriff's office? <laughs> yeah, what can I do for you? Well, I'm calling to report about my neighbor, Virgil Smith. He's hiding marijuana inside his firewood. Oh. Don't, qu don't quite know how he gets it inside them logs, but he's a hiding them in there. Thank you very much, sir. The next day, the sheriff's department, or the deputies, descend on Virgil's house. They search the shed where the firewood is kept. Using axes, they bust open every piece of wood to find no marijuana. They sneer at Virgil and leave. Shortly, the phone rings at Virgil's house. Hey, Virg! This here's Floyd! Did the sheriff come? Yeah, sure did. Did they chop y'all firewood? Yep. Well, happy birthday, buddy. <laughs> Rednecks know how to get her done. And then Gator knows about this one. How can you tell if a redneck is married? Do you know Gator? There's tobacco spit stains on both sides of the pickup truck. <laughs> well, let's pick, on the, let's pick on the Swedes and the Norwegians. Sven and Ole. They went into the garbage hauling business. All they had for a truck was Sven's old 1949 Ford pickup with the grain sides on it. They had just filled it to the top and started out for the dump when they were stopped by the police. The officer said, uh, that garbage was blown all over the top of that load and if they didn't find a way to hold it down, he was going to give them a ticket. So old Ole climbs up on top of it and lay spread eagle on top of the garbage. And as they drove along, they passed under a bridge. Two Swedes standing on the bridge saw the sight, and one of them remarked, Well, 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 would you look at that? Somebody threw away a perfectly good Norwegian. <laughs> Very popular amongst my Lutheran friends. <laughs> Open up our Bibles now to Joshua. We're going to be at chapter 9. We'll give a little lead into that. Off to a good start tonight. I left my purse at home, which included my glasses, driver's license, whatever. Pray that I drive carefully home. Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for your word. Your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, for orchestrating tonight's um, coming together from the songs that were sung, even to what Pastor Walt had to say. You knew, you knew that you knew. And I pray, God, now that I am obedient and that your Holy Spirit speaks through your word powerfully tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in chapter 9, but before we get there, we need to bring ourselves up to date. Joshua, of course, is a story about... God finally, finally has his marching group. He's got his second generation of, of men to go into the promised land to take the land. Many times it will say that God has given them the land, and other times it will say he's giving them the land. It was there. How many know when God says it's yours, it's yours? Yeah. little cooperation on your part, of course, is needed, and that's exactly what they had. They first of all cased the joint. They remember they sent two spies over into Jericho, that huge walled city that scared them to death when they sent the spies out, you know, 40 years earlier. And uh, the two spies were hid by a lady named Rahab. We'll mention her a little bit later. And sure enough, they were able to then come back and say, we can do it. We're going to take the land. They're fearful of us. We can take it. They listened to God. They sought God. They knew how important it was to obey God and get their marching orders from God. So we know the story. He marched around that wall, that squalled city for seven days. The last day was seven times, and then the walls came tumbling down. We don't know if it was an earthquake or whatever, but they came down. And then after that, we know what happens. They thought, hey, this is a piece of cake. So if you turn in your... Bibles will kind of peruse through real quickly to bring us up to date. After they had sought God, and they did it according to what he wanted them to do, it says in, um, let's see, we can pick it up here. In chapter, chapter, Well, anyway, 
anyways, they, they, uh, AI was the next city, and they thought, hey, we were able to take down, um, we were able to take down um, Jericho. So now he says, yeah, chapter 7, verse 4, he said, so, you know, let's just think about 3,000 men. We'll take 3,000 men up to, up to uh, AI, and we'll beat the snot out of us, Walt would say. Well, how many know they left running with their tails between their legs? I mean, after defeating Jericho, this, this was supposed to be a minor battle. Well, they got whooped. They came back, oh, God, God. Well, they found out from God that there was what? Sin in the camp. God had given strict orders, obedience again, necessary, not to take anything from Jericho when you leave because all the spoil belongs to God. Well, there was one guy, I say Aiken, I heard the boys say Aiken, remember that in that film? And uh, now he coveted. He saw some stuff he wanted. He took the booty and he hid it. And of course, God sees all things. And because of that, they lost their fight in AI. They took care of business. They got rid of Aiken. And then God says, go in and take AI now. Because I am going to now take you in there and I'm going to help you fight that battle. Well, they did. They, they ambushed him and then they had giant uh, nature came through and so forth. And so they were able to win. So now they're on a roll. They've had two victories under their belt. Okay? So let's take a look at chapter 9. What's happening now is God is leading these people, watch carefully, right center, right in the middle of the promised land that they're going to take. Because all the Canaanites are all living in there, and God said, this is your land, you're going to displace them, and this is for my people. And you know, it's kind of like the old civil war, you divide and conquer. And that's exactly what... <coughs> Hitler did the same thing, divide and conquer. And that's exactly what happened. They were dividing it, and all of a sudden there was a ripple effect. Ay, 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 these people are on a march, and their God must be pretty strong and powerful because look what's happening. So we see in chapter 9, it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan, referring to the west side, in the hills and the lowlands and all the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, and then it mentions all the different tribes, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Preserites, and all the otherites. Verse 2, they all gathered together with, to fight Joshua in Israel with one accord. I'm going to say it, stop there. I, I thought, one accord? I've heard that before. We always talk about one accord being a positive thing. When we're all together in one accord, we can do mighty things. Amen? Amen. Well, that principle applies to the enemy also. They were all in one accord. And as a group, they were going to be able to conquer and defeat Joshua and Israel. At least they thought so. But verse 3, there's a different group of people. These are people, they are actually Hivites. They are people who live in Canaan. And their name are the Gibeonites. They lived in Gibeon and surrounding cities. And they heard when Joshua had, what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai. And they decided to, they're not going to be the next one on the list. And after my studying, I found out that they probably were going to be the next ones that were going to be taken. So they thought, we're not going to even risk it. And they didn't put their trust in these, these, this uh, a group of uh, kings that were got, got together. So they had another plan. Verse 4, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors, and they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and parched sandals on their feet, old garments on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a far country now. Therefore, make a covenant with us. Make a comment here. Remember God had given uh, Moses... Somebody answer the phone. Uh, God made... God gave directions to Moses, listen carefully, that all the Canaanites, they were supposed to annihilate. But any of, their, uh, of the other countries, they could go in and conquer, but they couldn't kill them. They could enslave them or whatever, but this is the one. So when these people say, we come from a far country, I think they felt, well, we're safe now. We're not a part of the land they're trying to take. 
So they said, we come from a far country. Verse 7. Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you dwell among us. So how can we make a covenant with you? In other words, they started thinking twice. Wait a minute, how do we know you came from a far country? Verse 9. So they said to him, From a very far country your servants, notice they call themselves servants, have come because of the name of the Lord your God. I'm going to stop there. A name is everything that that person is. Believe it or not, there are different Louines, L-O-U-E-N-E, -E, in the United States, quite a few. I ran into one, I couldn't believe it. Usually I never had. But there's only one Louine Rattray, and Pastor Walt says, you got that. So when you hear my name, all the attributes, everything that I am, is related to that. So when they said, we knew that because of the name of your Lord God, they're saying, we came because of who the Lord your God is. Think about that. They weren't saying, our gods are stronger, I know they're not. No. We know who your Lord your God is. And then they go on to say, uh, we're, we're well aware and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites, these glasses, and all he did to the two kings of the Amorites on the other side, the east side of the Jordan, how he killed Sihon and Og and, Og and took over that entire east side of the Jordan River. Verse 11, Therefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants, now therefore make a covenant with us. And then they showed them the bread. See this, this bread of ours? We took hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed, but now look, it's all dry and moldy. And these wineskins... They were filled with great new wine, but look, they're all torn. And these are garments and sandals. They were great when we started, but look at now from a long, long journey. 14. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, some of their bread, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the rulers of the congregation swore to them. The minute, couple points. Number one, the minute they took the bread, that's almost like a prelude to a treaty agreement. They would break bread first of all. And the next thing they did, they relied on their senses. What they saw, what they smelled, what they perhaps tasted. Oh, these guys must be for real. How many realize that we often rely on the material world and we base stuff on our senses and make decisions? Just a cute aside. I make a bowl of fresh fruit all the time for Walt and I for our dessert because we don't eat anything else but that. And he's so funny, he'll pull it out of the refrigerator and the first thing he'll do is he'll go, I don't know, it kind of, what do you think? Why don't you taste it? I said, I don't want to taste it if it smells like it's spoiled. Which is he's relying on his senses. Nine times out of ten is true, okay? But we rely on our senses. Well, I just feel it's right. It must be right because of A, B, and C. And look here and look here. And you notice the big thing that they did. They did not what? They did not consult God. <coughs> didn't consult God. It's kind of another ripple effect like they didn't consult God before they went into that battle of Ai. And so they went ahead and took vows, they made a covenant, a covenant of peace with these people. Covenant of peace with these people. So let's see what happens next. Verse 16, 
And it happened at the end of three days. I think some time took place, and now they're coming to the last three days. After they had made a covenant with them, that they heard that they were really neighbors who dwelt near them. They found out, oh my God, they're Canaanites. Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities that where these Gibeonites had lived. Listen to this. Now their cities were Gibeon and all these other ones. But the children, verse 18, but the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel, and all the creation of the congregation complained against the rulers. What? We're not going to fight these guys because they lied to us and fooled us, and we made a stupid govern agreement with them, and you're not going to let us take them down? They're Canaanites. We're supposed to kill Canaanites. But they would not allow them to kill them. Why? Because they had made a covenant with those people. Amen. Most of us would think, boy, those, I had got to hand it to those, those um, Gibeonites. They're pretty clever. How many, I mean, you think about what they did. They're pretty clever. And you kind of sympathize with, with God's people. I mean, after all, it looked like it. It looked like it. It looked good. They meant no harm, whatever. Those peace brothers. And, and now you've got this mess. You know, the biggest principle that I want to communicate tonight is this. Disobedience is no solution to consequences of a previous disobedience. I'll say it again. Disobedience is no solution to consequences of a previous disobedience. Just because they, they disobeyed, they did not seek God, and they went ahead and made that covenant with those people, then for them to disobey the second time is not going to cut it. Yes, God forgives. God is love, but God is also holy. And the reason why these people, if they were to go ahead and break that peace agreement with those people and go ahead and fight the Canaanites, the reputation of their God was like this. Because obviously, the God that they're, that's leading them is wishy-washy. And, uh, uh. and I started thinking about that. I wonder what we do to the God we serve, the way we act in the world. The way we handle it, the way we, we treat God, the way we handle ourselves in public and things that we do that we know are not right and yet we have a Christian t-shirt on or we're saying praise God, praise God, God bless you, God bless you or holding a sign or whatever. You know really we are reflecting the God that we serve and they were adamant about this. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. That was a biggie for them. So then let's see what happens. Verse 19, Then all the rulers said to the congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we had sworn to them. And the rulers said to them, Let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers, for all the congregation as the rulers had promised them. I think Joshua sought God on this one. Then Joshua called for them, and he spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us, saying we are very far from us, when you dwell right here? Look at verse 23. Now therefore you are cursed, and none of you shall be freed from being slaves. You're going to be woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. So they answered Joshua and said what? Because your servants, by the way, they said, we're servants. 
And so now it's like, you came to us saying you're servants, guess what? You get to be our servants. You're going to be our servants. Because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you, therefore we were very much afraid for our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now here we are in your hands. Do with us as it seems good and right to do to us. That's the same, it's almost the same picture of Rahab. Remember when the two spies went in? And what is the first thing? Rahab hid the spies. And when he taught when they talked to Rahab, what did she say? She says, We, we know that your God, your Lord, is God. We know that your Lord is God. We've heard what he's done in parting the Red Sea. We heard what he did to the Egyptians. And she sought what? Refuge from the attack that was coming. And she got it. And she got it. And now you have the Gibeonites who are coming. They're saying, we'll be your servants. Oh, they were sneaky about it. But how many know that the providence of God is over all of this? That all things are going to work together for good. And God knows who are his chosen people. Because, listen carefully, because, because uh, Joshua was obedient, was obedient, and did not break that vow, when they had to defend those five cities from this coalition of kings that attacked, they were able to beat them all, because God was with them. Always obedience, my friends. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Yes, you're going to have consequences to your mistakes. You're, you're going to happen. You're going to happen. God doesn't take away consequences. But the answer to those consequences is not disobedience. Let me give you an example. Pastor Walt. Pastor Walt made a vow to me before Almighty God when we got married the first time, until death, until death, and I made a vow to him in the presence of God, until death do us part. It's called marriage vows. I know that's kind of an obsolete institution nowadays, but it's called marriage vows. All right? When he chose to break those vows, and tell me that some fortune teller told him that he needs to divorce me. He broke that vow. Disobedience. Consequences. Those years, what it did to me and where I went and spiraled downhill and did all my crazy stuff and what it did to him. He comes to the Lord. He still has consequences. Because he's not married. The consequences of his divorce. He's single. Now he could go and say, you know, I know God understands that I'm lonely and I know God wants me to be happy. So I'm sure he'll understand when I go marry this one over here. Or he'll understand, oh, she's a Christian, and she called me on TBN while I was working as a prayer partner, and we prayed <laughs> together. So I'm sure God would understand. No. Because God told him he broke a vow. He kept himself separate. He did not answer the consequences with another disobedience. He didn't answer the consequences with another disobedience. He said, I'm not going to marry until God, you show me. And of course, God brought me back into the picture. We were remarried. Now just think, yeah. just think, what would have happened if he would have answered the consequences with a disobedience. And we never would have. And I wonder if there ever would be a church on the street and all that's going on. Now, we still experience consequences from stupid decisions and the consequences that we reap because of the broken vows. 
But let me tell you something. Being obedient, it just far surpasses. And what God is able to do because we were obedient. Now, what about these poor Gibeon, Gibeonites? I think this is so good. You know, the Gibeonites, remember they were told to be water carriers, but they're going to be also workers right there in the house of the Lord. What a better place to be exposed to all these animal sacrifices and so forth. Do you know what? Later on, the Gibeonites... Well, Gibeon was the place where David had the tabernacle for a while. Gibeon was the place where Solomon had that special revelation when he wanted to ask for wisdom and God ministered to him. Do you know that the Gibeonites, when the people were in captivity and brought back into the promised land, the Gibeonites were allotted a certain property in the Promised Land. Did you know it was the Gibeonites that helped rebuild the wall with Nehemiah? Do you know that one of David's mighty men of valor was a Gibeonite? What am I saying? God's grace was upon these people. And look what they were able to attain. By the same token, God's grace was upon Joshua and those people. Because of their obedience, they got victory. Amen. So, if you learn anything tonight, my friends, when you disobey and you got consequences, don't deal with the consequences with more disobedience. Don't rely on your feelings and your flesh. You guys, we are more than a material world. There's a spiritual world. And in the spiritual world, you know well, very well that there are entities that are out to kill, destroy. We have got to be tuned in, as Pastor Walt said, eyes on God, no matter what. Because God is a loving Father. And part of his reckless love that you love so well is a reckless love that says, I love you enough that I'm going to correct you. I'm going to correct you. But the bottom line is, through it all, he's going to work all things together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you so much, God. Help us to balance, oh God, our understanding of you. Forgive us, oh God, for rationalizing. Forgive us, oh Lord, for allowing petty sins to come in and shift us into kind of a neutral gear and just in our relationship with you, God. Forgive us, oh God, for battling the consequences of our errors, our own sin. And help us, oh God, to deal with them in obedience to you, oh God, because we know that you have our best interests at heart. Thank you, Lord, for what you've begun and what you're going to continue to do in each one of us individually and collectively. In Jesus' name, amen.